before that cross-examination began and all the way back to 1975 when you held the view that, uh, that fa- the, the presence of a father itself could be a determinative factor in adjustment outcomes. Is that, was that a fair characterization of your views as you held it in 1975? Well, I think that the issue had to do with the specific characteristics of the father and whether it was there was something specifically important about the uh, maleness of the parent that was important. I still think that that fathers are important uh, figures in children's development and that when children do have father figures that those relationships are very significant ones. And why is it that your views between from before I was born to now. (laughs) (laughs) This is your witness. Have changed. (laughs) What has changed your views in the intervening 35 years? Well, the the, the, uh, body of evidence has has been what's changed it. Their original view, as I said, was an hypothesis that uh, came from, largely from theory um, at the time, and since then we have had hundreds, thousands of articles that have explored the implications of, of that uh, belief and found it to be wanting. Now, when the literature in your field speaks of fatherless families or father absence, what family structures is the literature describing when it uses those terms? Well, overwhelmingly, that term is used to describe um, uh, heterosexual families um, in which um, single heterosexual women are raising their children, um, uh, either by choice or as a result of a family dissolution. In your experience in the field, does that when a study identifies a group of fatherless families, does that group ever include families headed by lesbian mothers? That term has been used in some of the studies in the field, yes. And how how frequently? Um, uh, There are a small number of studies that that use that term, um, uh, particularly because some of them were designed to explore this issue about the um, uh, importance of having a male parent present in the lives of those children. And so to underscore that question, that term is used. But in the main, in the vast majority of of the studies, when people talk about the literature on father absence, they're talking about the literature on uh, children being raised by heterosexual women, um, uh, not without a partner in the home. When, what conclusions then can one draw about the adjustment of children with lesbian parents from a body of literature that studies fatherless families. Well, the um, studies of of children being raised by lesbians, um, uh, children who are growing up uh, without having a father figure in the home, provide one way of of determining whether children uh, develop well-adjusted when they don't have a, a male parent figure. And the, does the fatherless family's research allow us to draw any conclusion about the adjustment of children raised by lesbian parents? No, the, no, it does not. Does the research on fatherless families tell us anything about the adjustment of children with gay parents? Not directly, no. Now, how about the, the literature concerning divorced families. Does, in your experience in the field, can we extrapolate any conclusions from the literature on divorce about the adjustment of children of, with gay or lesbian parents? No, not directly. Why not? Well, because they, they are not, um, it, they're not exploring the influence of the sexual orientation of the parent. And what about the uh, research, the body of research concerning step families? Can the research about step families, step families, 
tell us anything about the adjustment of children with gay or lesbian parents. Yeah. Um, who, Dr. Lamb, is Lauren Marks? Um, Lauren Marks was the, one of the experts that had been identified on the other side in this litigation. And in connection with your work on this case, did you, uh, did you review Dr. Marks' uh, reports in this litigation? Yes, I did. And did you uh, review the deposition I, I took of him? Yes, I did. And uh, at, at this time, um, with Your Honor's permission, I would like to play a clip of Dr. Marks' deposition. This clip is 40 seconds in length. Very well. Your Honor, we would certainly object to it being in evidence. We don't object to it being played. Well. Yes. How would you characterize a married lesbian couple that adopted a child at birth after they were married? A married lesbian couple that adopted a child at, after the child's birth. Um, no, no biological ties since either mother. I believe like the heterosexual couple that adopts that I mentioned earlier, they probably deserve a discrete category. And you didn't compare that category in the course of formulating your opinion in this case? No, not in this report. Dr. Lamb, do you agree with Dr. Marx's view that gay and lesbian parents should be viewed as a, quote, discrete category with when studying the adjustment of children? Well, in order to understand the influence on children's adjustment, yes. Now, in the course of Mr. Thompson's uh, examination, cross-examination of you, you mentioned a, uh, a new study by uh, Michael Rosenfeld uh, based on the census data. Um, that, that study has now been marked as, uh, or it was marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 2299. Um, can you tell us, uh, Dr. Lamb, why that study is important? Well, I think it's very important because it is the only study that, that we have. It's a very rare study, actually, um, uh, which compares uh, all the children in the country um, uh, with respect to the family environments in which they are reared. Um, uh, and that study shows by, by looking at um, the couple of thousand children in the country being raised by um, lesbian couples and a uh, couple of thousand children in the country re being raised by gay couples um, and compares them with children being raised by heterosexual couples with respect to one important index which is the extent to which children are withheld or held back at school. Um, and shows that when you um, use the appropriate controls, there are no differences in this index of adjustment between children who are being raised by gay, lesbian, or heterosexual parents. And would, in your experience in, in the field of developmental psychology, is a sample based on the United States Census of adequate size to be reliable? <laughs> yes, I think so. Uh, and. I, I want to return briefly to Mr. Thompson's, I guess, his main point was that the Rosenfeld study compared heterosexual couples and not uh, married heterosexual couples. Now, why, why would it make sense in, in your field of developmental psychology to, to maintain as a con control group for unmarried gay and lesbian parents a uh, the control group of heterosexual couples raising children. Well, that, that seems the most appropriate comparison in this case. And what, why would it be the most appropriate comparison? Because you have unmarried um, 
parents in all of those groups. Now, uh, in your field of developmental psychology, how is the term biological parent or biological father or biological mother, how is that used in the literature of child adjustment, specifically the adjective biological? Well, it's used in a multiple, um, a number of ways. It's sometimes used in the, um, to refer specifically to the biological genetic DNA uh, sharing link between individuals. Um, uh, but in, in many studies, actually, um, uh, the term is used more inclusively to include individuals being raised in um, intact families. Um, uh, and so children, for example, who've been adopted uh, into a two-parent family would often be included with the biological, uh, the, the children who are being considered to be in a biological family. So it would include within the term biological parent a child that had, or a parent that had no genetic relationship to the child. That's correct, yes. And uh, I would like to, at this point, uh, publish a demonstrative of PX 1040. Yeah. Where is it? That's it. All right. Um, I'll just read from this. Uh, this is uh, from Robert Johnson's study entitled The Relationship Between Family Structure and Adolescent Substance Abuse. Thus, uh, the first relation, quote, mother, might be either a biological or an adoptive mother. Similar, similarly, the third relation, quote, father, might be either a biological or an adoptive father. Is that consistent with your views of how the term biological is used in the field of developmental psychology? That's the frequent way in which it's used in the survey literature, yes. And um, I would like to publish a, a, another demonstrative from, from that same study. My screen is not working. Neither will ours. Oh, there we go. Can Good you... Can you, Dr. Lamb, please read um, the bottom, the, the footnote, the highlighted text from the footnote there? As most studies do not distinguish biological parents from adoptive parents, so the latter is a rare family form in virtually all studies. Presumably, though, families in which both parents have adopted the child are considered to be intact. Is that footnote, again, consistent with your view of how the term biological is used in the field of developmental psychology? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I would offer into evidence Plaintiff's Exhibit PX 1040, which is the aforementioned study, and also the exhibit I mentioned before, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2299, which is the Rosenfeld study. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. They are admitted. Thank you. Um, now, you were shown a number, a great number of documents by Mr. Thompson, and one of them was uh, a literature review by Brad Wilcox, which is located in Binder 2. Still have Binder 2? One minute. And it's at tab 26 of binder 2. Council of which tab? Tab 26 of 113. And if you would turn to page 24, I will, uh, I will just read for you 
uh, it starts at the bottom of page 24, uh, and then it carries over onto page 25. It says, data from the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse show that even after controlling for ACE, age, race, gender, and family income, teens living with both biological parents are significantly less likely to el use illicit drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. How do you suspect Mr. Wilcox was using the term biological in this sentence? Um, I assume that he was using it to include um, adopted children, since the reference, I believe, is to the same uh, SAMHSA report that, that you just gave us. Would you be referring to the study of the Johnson, the Johnson study that has just been admitted into evidence as PX1040? That's correct. And, and it would normally be the case within your field of developmental psychology that when you cite to a source, you use the terms in the same manner in which the source does. Unless you clarify that you're not doing so. Um, so, now I would like to play a, a, a second clip from the deposition of, uh, of Dr. Mark concerning the Wilcox study and the Johnson study. This one is somewhat longer. I'm moving now, Professor Mark, to paragraph 15, and specifically the last sentence of paragraph 15 of your report, which is marked as Exhibit C. And it appears on page 4 of your report. Mm -hmm. And there you say, in a recent related review, Wilcox and colleagues state that, quote, teens living with both biological parents are significantly less likely to use illicit drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. And you italicized the word both biological parents. Why did you italicize the word both biological parents? Uh, was going back to the point that biology is important in connection with marriage and parenting. Wanted to underscore that. Would you please <coughs> turn, Professor Mark, to pages to page twenty-four mm -hmm. and twenty-five, which is. the page that you cited for this quotation. And I would ask you to just read the sentence that begins on the last line of page 24 and continues to page 25. And you can read it yourself. I'll read it for the record. Okay. Data from the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse show that even after controlling for age, race, gender, and family income, teens living with both biological parents are significantly less likely to elicit drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Now, Wilcox and colleagues not define the term biological parents, do they? Well, if he'd like, are you giving him a minute to look at the study, or are you asking him off the top of his head? I don't, I don't know if they do or not, uh, Mr. McGill. But as you had, just as you said before, that you use terms in the same manner in which the researchers you cite use the terms. Would you expect Wilcox and colleagues to use the term biological parents in the same manner in which the researchers who they cite use the term? Uh, 
I I believe I would, but uh, there there are always exceptions. If Wilcox and colleagues used the term biological parent in a manner different from the authority for which they cite, would that suggest that the proposition is not supported by the authority that they cite? Could, could you restate? Sure. If Wilcox and colleagues define biological parents differently from the authority that they cited, wouldn't that suggest that the proposition that Wilcox and colleagues gave is not supported by the citation that they give to this? So you're saying uh, if it's overextended, the use is overextended, uh, if their definition doesn't match that in the source that they cite, is that a problem? It, it, in essence, let's say that, yeah, that's a mistake. I'd ask you now to look at page 40 of the Wilcox. Same report. Same report. This is into the footnote. Okay. Now, Wilcox and colleagues drop a footnote called number 103 at page 25, and they cite a 1996 study of Robert Johnson. Is that the same study that you also cite as a see also in footnote 16 of your report? It is. Have you read the Johnson study? I've read portions of it. Uh, but I'll leave it to that. Do you know how Johnson defined the term biological? I, I don't recall. No. Would you please mark this as exhibit number five? Can you tell me what based on your knowledge as you sit here, what was Johnson's primary conclusion in this 1996 study? Uh, no. I'm going back. I'm talking about hundreds of different studies. Do you know what data Johnson drew upon to I draw his conclusions? I don't, uh, I don't remember, except that it was a study that came out of one of the National Institutes of Health, I believe, uh, here in the D.C. area. Usually that data is good. And Wilcox tells us, in fact, that it's from the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse. Does that refresh your recollection? Uh, I honestly didn't remember for sure either way. I'd like you to look at page I'd like you to look at page two of Mr. Dr. Johnson's study. <coughs> the very first bullet point. Page two. I'm going to read that for the record. Okay. Adolescents living with two biological open parent, including adoptive closed parent parents are significantly less likely to use alcohol, cigarettes, and illicit drugs or to report problems associated with the use in adolescents not living with two biological parents. Had you read that before you signed your report? I don't remember reading that line. Uh, Can you please now turn to page six of his report? Mm -hmm. Footnote three, down at the bottom of the page. And I'll read it and you can read it to yourself. Most studies do not distinguish biological parents from adoptive parents since the latter is a rare family form in virtually all studies. Presumably though, families in which both parents have adopted the child are considered to be intact. Have you read that footnote before you signed your report? I don't remember reading this footnote. 
Do you believe that Wilcox's statement that teens living with both biological parents are significantly less likely to use illicit drugs, alcohol, tobacco? Do you believe that's accurately supported by Johnson's study? Taking a close look at these at these definitions that have been presented, uh, I would withdraw that. Would you also withdraw your emphasis on both biological parents? Certainly so. Would you delete the word biological? Uh, I would. Dr. Lamb, do you think Dr. Marks was correct based on his reading of the research that he cited to, at his deposition, withdraw his emphasis on the word biological? Certainly his use of this document, yes. You think he was wrong to even offer that he should delete the word biological? I don't have his statement in front of me, but yes, the word biological clearly is not supported in this context. This time, Your Honor, I would ask that the court take judicial notice of the two deposition clips of Dr. Mark. Very well. You'll have to supply the specific uh, page and line reference to the uh, written transcript of that position as we discussed this morning. Of course, Your Honor. Your Honor, we would object to uh, judicial notice being taken of, you know, a snippet of the deposition without the report and the context coming in. If they want to do that. First of all, we don't think it's appropriate, but even if it were, we would say then Dr. Mark's report should come in so that the record is complete and it can be seen in its totality. Well, let's take that up at the time we begin to sort out some of these evidentiary issues, but what I'm interested in right now is the page and line references so that we know precisely what testimony you're talking about. You want that right now? No, of course not. Okay. <laughs> I'll be happy to provide that at the appropriate time, Your Honor. Fine. Um, I'd now uh, quickly like to turn to um, Defendant Intervenors Exhibit 108. This is uh, the book, Fatherless America. You don't have a copy of it, okay. but that was one of the many documents you were asked to opine on. And you mentioned that you wrote a a book, you wrote, wrote a book review concerning Fatherless America. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And uh, can you just, do, do you recall what you wrote about uh, about Mr. Blankenhorn's book? Um, uh, well, I was concerned that, that Mr. Blankenhorn had uh, misrepresented much of the research, particularly the research on what I think you've called today gender differentiated parenting. And um, do you recall if your review was otherwise a favorable review of his book? Um, well, there was a, a second concern, um, uh, which uh, was the fact that um, Blankenhorn's book a, confused the issues of correlation and causality, shall we say. Um, uh, and really, um, I think misrepresented the state of knowledge at that point regarding the ways in which children's adjustment might be affected by their experiences. Um, uh, and uh, we went through some of the reasons for that earlier on today. Um, I'd now like to publish a demonstrative of page 527 of that, uh, of that book review. Would you read it, please, Dr. Lamb? Blankenhorn's tendency to paint alternative visions in absurd or ridiculous terms in order to facilitate his dismissal of them leads him in at least one important case to undercut his own thesis. Would you characterize that as a favorable review of any book? <laughs> no. Uh, Your Honor, the, we have marked uh, Dr. Lamb's the totality of Dr. Lamb's review as Plaintiff's Exhibit 2548, and we ask that it would be admitted into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Gate is admitted. Um, 
you recall among the documents you reviewed, uh, Mr. Lamb, Dr. Lamb, the uh, Sorantico? I think I misspoke. It's 2548, isn't it? Yes, Your Honor. It's uh, Exhibit 2548. That is Dr. Lamb's book review of Fatherless America. I beg your pardon. Sorry for the interruption. Not at all. Uh, Dr. Lamb. Do you remember uh, your brief review of the Sorantico study uh, with Mr. Thompson? Yes, I did. And that uh, appeared at tab 49, uh, I believe, of which would now be binder 3. You, you need Don't not... Don't get it out? No. You, you needn't bring it out. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you if there was anything else you wanted to say about the Sorantico study. Well, the, the key thing about the Sorantico study um, uh, are actually some problems that, that Sorantico himself acknowledges in this report. Um, uh, most importantly, the fact is while it's a, a study that um, ostensibly compares the adjustment of children being raised by um, uh, two parent married, two, uh, so two heterosexual parents married, two heterosexual parent cohabiting, and gay and lesbian families. Um, uh, the groups are clearly not comparable in um, very important ways, um, notably the fact that the children in the cohabiting and the same-sex parent groups um, uh, had frequently experienced the separation and divorce of their parents, uh, in many cases not long before the data about them were gathered. Um, uh, and as we've talked about today, there's a substantial body of evidence showing that the um, experience of the parents' divorce, the conflict around that, and as Sarantikos noted, the fact that many of these children frequently moved home, are all factors that would have affected their adjustment as well, and that that would clearly be needed to taken into account in, in the, um, trying to interpret the results. Uh, in, in many ways, this is more illustrative of the effects of divorce than it is a study that really illustrates much about the effects of same-sex parenting. Um, a second problem, again, as, as Sarantikos does acknowledge late in his article, is the fact that all of the data were gathered uh, by interviewing the teachers. Um, and he recognizes this as a particular problem in this case because many of the teachers um, acknowledged having homophobic attitudes. Um, uh, and the fact that that may have biased their um, reports is clearly something that one would need to take into account. Um, finally, they used very different ways of, of selecting the samples for this study, um, which again compromises the, the ability to use that in the body of literature. And so while at the, the results themselves are out of step with the results of the rest of the research, understanding those deficiencies of the study makes it clearer to understand exactly why those results are so far out of step with the rest of the literature. Have the findings of the Sorantico study ever been corroborated or duplicated in another study? They have not. Are you aware of any other study uh, that finds children who are parented by gays or lesbians to be less well-adjusted than children who are parented by heterosexual parents? No, there's no other study that finds that as the major report. I mean, there were a couple of, of studies we talked about that over the course of the day in which there would be one measure showing a, a difference one way or another. And clearly you expect to find those kinds of local variations when you're talking about a large body of literature. But there is no other study that, that shows uh, in this way the um, major problems on the part of children being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Do you recall where the Ceranico study was published? Uh, it, it was published in um, an Australian magazine called Children Australia. Is that a peer-reviewed journal, to your knowledge? I don't think so, but I don't know. Does it appear on any of the you know, electronic databases that, that are used in your field? No, it does not. Has it ever been relied upon as a, as a, in, by one of your colleagues or someone else who's in a viewed as an authority in the field of developmental psychology? Um, uh, I think most people in the field of studying children's adjustment have the same concerns about the study that I do. 
why do you uh, why the hundred or so studies on which you rely provide a reliable basis for your opinion in this case? Well, I think they provide a reliable basis because, um, uh, firstly, they provide a very consistent account of the um, healthy adjustment of most children being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Um, but secondly, I think what, what makes that literature persuasive is the fact that the patterns of results are very similar to the patterns of results that have been obtained in the wider body of research on factors that affect children's adjustment. Um, for example, children um, whose lesbian parents um, have a conflictful relationship are less well adjusted than children with lesbian parents um, who have a more harmonious relationship, just as you find in, in the literature on heterosexual families. Uh, and so with respect to all of the broad factors that we spoke about first thing this morning, we see that it's the same factors that predict the adjustment of children in gay and lesbian families as they do in, when children have heterosexual parents. Um, uh, and that, as I said before, the evidence makes clear that um, having a gay or lesbian parent does not make children more likely to be maladjusted than if those children were raised by heterosexual parents. You testified that there were fewer studies of gay parents than lesbian parents and the adjustment of their respective children. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Why, in the absence of an equal number of studies of gay male parents and the adjustment of their children, are you comfortable opining that their children are no less likely to be well-adjusted than children of heterosexual parents? Well, I think that, that um, I feel comfortable doing that because one has to look at the totality of the evidence base um, and start off from the fact that we do have a good understanding of what it is that affects the adjustment of children. Um, uh, and in the context of understanding that, it's also very clear from lots of research that the gender and the sexual orientation of the parent is not one of those factors that's important. Um, uh, secondly, we have the evidence that, that shows that it is the same factors that affect uh, children's adjustment regardless of the sexual orientation of their parents. Um, uh, third, we do have um, a growing number, a much smaller number, but a growing number of studies that look directly at the adjustment of children being raised um, by gay parents. Um, and the, the combination of, of these different bodies of literature, I think, makes me confident that the um, uh, outcomes for children raised by gay fathers are the same as those for children raised by lesbian mothers and the same as those for children being raised by heterosexual parents, taking into account all the other factors that we've spoken about. At the start of Mr. Thompson's cross-examination, you confessed to membership in the ACLU, the NAACP, the Nature Conservancy, Amnesty International, and Mr. Thompson even identified you as a supporter of public broadcasting. <laughs> Did the Corporation for Public Broadcasting influence your opinion in this case? No, it did not. Did anything other than the social science research in your field influence your opinion in this case? No, it did not. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. Very well. Dr. Lamb, thank you for your testimony, sir. You may step down. And can we call the next witness? Thank you.